Hey, this is Brian with ActiveMelody.com. In this week's guitar lesson, we're going to be talking about secondary dominant chords and what they are and why you need to know about them. And you're going to find that they're incredibly useful whether you're writing chord arrangements and you're looking for some more interesting chords or you're playing lead and you just want to sound more sophisticated. You want a better tension and release that you can add to your your lead playing. That's really what they're designed for. So I've got the lesson split into two parts. In this video we're going to learn the theory part, so we're going to cover that. If you want to watch the second video, which is, goes into the chord arrangement that I played in the beginning, I'll show you how to play that, as well as download the tablature and access the on-screen tab viewer for this, you can get all of those things by going to activemelody.com, go to the weekly lessons page and do a search for EP370. Alright, so I'm excited for this week's lesson because by the end of this, you're not only going to understand what a secondary dominant chord is, and some of you like have never heard of them and you don't even know why you need to know that, but we'll go over what they are, but you'll also know how to use them. And you'll see that, first of all, they're very easy to find, easy to play, and they're, they make your music sound so much better because you're creating, it's really just creating tension and release, that's all it is. But we're going to go through that with practical examples, and by the end of this you'll know how to do it. So before we can talk about what a secondary dominant chord is, we first have to talk about what a primary dominant chord is. So every key has a primary dominant chord. And if we're playing in the key of G, we'll use the key of G as an example, um, <clears throat> it has a primary dominant chord, and that is the V chord. So the V chord of whatever key you're in, that's your primary dominant chord. So in the key of G, if we take the, the, the major scale, this is how we find the V chord. Take the major scale, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, you can work that out by ear. Uh, but we count up five, so we put a number to each of those. One, two, three, four, five. That note is a D note, and that is our V chord. So if I played a D7 chord, just your good old D7, that would be your tension chord. You can hear that when I play it. It's creating tension, and then we release that tension by going back to the one chord. And in essence, that's all music is, really. If you think about it, in any style, it's creating tension and release. And when we learn how to play these secondary dominant chords, you, it just gives you the ability to create more tension and release. A great example of that tension and release happens in blues. Like if you look at a 12 bar blues, you're playing a one, four, five, and the five builds up a tension, and then we're back to the one, four, five, and that just, just keeps repeating. Building tension, releasing the tension, building tension, and releasing. Um, so now before we get into secondary dominant chords, uh, you need to understand this principle, and that is every one of these notes, instead of it just being a single note, it's also a chord when you're talking about a key. Every one of those notes can be a chord. So when we're playing in the key of G, you would have, a, and there's a formula for that. I'll put that up on the screen. It's major, your two chord is minor, three chord is minor, four chord is major, five chord is major, six chord is minor. Now the seven chord, which is the little guy that never gets talked about, that's a, a half diminished chord. And we're not going to go there just because it really doesn't have a lot of use in this example. Uh, maybe in a future thing I'll talk about it, but most of what you need to know, 90 something percent, is in those one through six chords. So that's the formula for it. And so when we're playing a, a blues and we talk about one, four, five, one, four, five. Right? Those are your major chords uh, because they're major in that formula I just gave. Now for each one of those chords, they also have their own five chord. That's what a secondary dominant chord is. So that two chord, which is an A minor, it has a five chord. One, two, three, four, five. And so you play that the dominant seven chord of that. That's the in that case it's an E7. And then there's a re release. See, tension, release. We go to this B chord, we come up here, play an F sharp seven, tension, release. And so each chord now has its own five chord, and that's what a secondary dominant chord is. But instead of having to sit and count it out, da 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 da, you don't want to do that every time because that, that'll wear you out. There's a formula for that that I use, and that is based on two shapes. I use it off the E shape and off of the A chord shape. So if we're looking at the, the E chord shape, this is out of Caged, 
So I'm playing the G chord here. Where my ring finger is, that's the five chord. So that note, I can just replace it with that chord and then that's the five chord. Very easy to find. So now if I'm playing an A sharp and I want to know what the five chord is, it's just wherever my ring finger is. Tension, release. I can get to it without looking at the neck. I don't need to look at a chord chart. I can just feel it wherever my ring finger is. Right? So that's how you do it off of the E chord shape. The same is true uh, off of the A chord shape. So if we're playing a C chord, for example, and we're playing the A chord shape, I've got my index finger, in this case, on the third fret, on that C note there. So wherever that finger is, we're going to go down one string. So we would go to the G, in that case, and play the G7. So there's, there's the five chord, and there's the one chord. Five chord, one chord. Five chord, one chord. And that works whether the whether it's major or minor. That's what I love about that. So back to that uh, G chord, if it was a G minor, for example. So I take my middle finger off. I can still play the five chord to the one chord. So you can use that formula for major chords or minor chords on the E chord shape and on the A chord shape. So that is how you determine your secondary dominant chords. So we know now a little formula. You know what they are. You still may not know how to use or, or where you would use it, but at least you know how to do that. And by the way, if you're not sure how to do that, if that's confusing, if you don't understand any of this, leave a comment and I'll try and uh, I'll make sure to try and, and respond to that wherever you're viewing this on YouTube, on Active Melody. Um, so um, okay, so now let's talk about how we use it. So this song that I'm playing in the intro. It's all a series of tensions and releases, tension and release. And what I did for that was, I wanted to take a very, very simple, boring, predictable uh, chord structure. And so I, well, here, here's what I started with. How many songs have this? It's in everything, right? You could name hundreds and hundreds of songs, thousands of songs, using that same uh, formula. In that case, it's a G, E minor, C, D. But I wanted to show you how secondary dominance works. So now, if we let's look at that. So we're going to go from the G to the E minor. Now the E minor sounds good with that G because it's in the chord family. All of those chords are in the G chord family, the, sh the family I just showed you. So where is that E minor? There's the E, right? So it's the sixth chord. So we're in this case we're going from the one chord to the sixth chord. Now, so what was the formula? You should be able to pause the video. It'd be a great little quiz for yourself and find the five chord of that E minor chord. How can you do it? You can use either the the, the E chord shape or the A chord shape. I'll let you do that and uh, and try and work it out on your own. Assume you've done that already. So the E chord. If we're looking at that now, in this case, our bar, we're not barring with our finger, but the nut, the nut is the bar. So you would put um, your where your middle finger is there. That would be your five chord of that E chord. And that's a B chord, B7 chord, right? Same is true if I use the E minor chord shape up here. I go, remember we go down one, there's your B7 chord. So are you getting that? So that's the, how we find the five chord of that E minor. So let's go back to the beginning of this. So we have the G. I throw in the B7 chord. That's why that chord works. And then, so it created a tension out of nowhere. This unnecessary tension. Ah, and then there's re release of the tension, right? So, th so that's why I went, instead of going like this, I went like this. Now, the next chord I was going to get to was a C. So what is the five chord of C? I'll let you pause the video and try and work that out. Uh, we have different ways we can do it. We could look at the C chord shape here, right? It's the G7 chord. So what I played was, and that's interesting because that's the key of the song, but it's still the five chord of C. So I just played a G7 chord there and then went to the C. So when we back up, we have minor, G7, to the C. Then I was going to go to a D chord, 
Instead of just going to the D, I went to the five chord of the D first. I wanted to create the tension first and then release it. What is the five chord of D? It's an A7, so I play the A7 to the D. And then I go to the, well, the D7, which is the five chord back of the one chord. So I've just created this big cycle now of tensions and releases based on now what we're playing is still very simple, but it's a good example of how it all works, how this tension and release thing works. And so when you're seeing these chords, like you know, if you're seeing a B seven chord, you real and some of you go, well, that's that's that chord is not in the chord family. That's not in the key, and it's not. But now you know why it works. It's a secondary dominant chord. It's coming from somewhere else. We're borrowing it. Some people call those borrowed chords. Um, Sometimes it's referred to as a borrowed chord. And in that one instance, we've changed the key to get us back in, in the pocket, back into the key. And the other thing I wanted to just mention is when you're playing lead, uh, let me give you a quick example of this. I, I wish I had a looper pedal here, but I'm going to play a G chord, an A minor chord, and a B minor chord. Now remember, that's the one, your two, and your three chord that we talked about earlier. But instead of me just playing, if I was playing lead, you know, I could just trace the notes of the, each of those chords, and that's very safe. But what if I worked in the secondary dominant? What if I went? You hear the difference? Hear that tension? Release, tension, release. Now, I, I'm not doing a super sophisticated job of, of playing these arpeggios, but you can hear it even without the chords under it that I'm creating as a, as a lead. And if I was just playing the chords and I played that, um, you know, in this case, that would be the E7 chord arpeggio, it would work. It would sound really nice with that. It's a nice little tension that you're creating in your lead. So it's this all applies not just to playing uh, rhythm and chord arrangements, but it also can spill into your lead plan. Hope that gives you some ideas, and I'll see you in part two where we'll go over uh, the rest of this, and I'll break down in detail what I played in the intro. Um, and uh, also, I've got everything tabbed out so that you can follow it that way.